All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being here today. And welcome to the sixth annual uh, Robert J. Morris Chemistry Symposium. Uh, I'm Robert Samuelson. I'm the chairperson in the Department of Chemistry, and it's uh, my honor to preside over this symposium today. So as many of you uh, know, I'll go through a few slides here. Robert Joseph Morris, again, which many of us know just as simply Bob, uh, completed his BS in chemistry with honors in uh, 1986. And then he went on to do a PhD in Dr. Uh, Greg uh, Girolami's inorganic chemistry group at the University of Illinois. And here's a picture from uh, 1987 of that research group where uh, if you can see Bob in the picture, he's the one in the red shirt on the left in the front. So. And then he actually did a NIH postdoctoral fellowship at UC Berkeley, or better known as Cal to some of us. So. And uh, that was with Bob Bergman. And then quickly returning uh, as assistant professor at Ball State University in 1991. So by 1993, he had already obtained research funding from the Indiana Academy of Science, a research corporation, and the American Chemical Society, <coughs> and was uh, teaching a lot of instrumentation courses at the time. He was fully promoted in 1999 and was elected chairperson of the Department of Chemistry in 2002. And so here's a picture when he was chairperson and a former president was visiting the department. And there's maybe a couple faculty. There. This may be close to our keynote speaker being here as a student as well. And then later he accepted a position as the associate provost for research as well as dean of the graduate school. Here's a picture of him over in the graduate school. Uh, and this time, uh, this position actually converted to an associate vice president position at the time. In 2016, he was actually serving as the acting provost and executive vice president for academic affairs at Ball State. Here's a picture of one of the commencements, spring commencement. So. And then as many of you know, uh, Bob passed away on Monday, November 28, 2016, at Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis. So with that, uh, I'd just like to thank all the friends, family, colleagues that are here today, as well as the ones here and others that have supported this uh, symposium fund, number 1503, as a tribute to Bob. So the legacy of the symposium now includes a number of keynote speakers over the past six years. Uh, many of those were passed, so just to go through very quickly for people that haven't come to everyone so far, uh, Greg uh, Gerlami gave the, the first talk in 18 and then one of his uh, uh, apprentices and one of his uh, former grad students that he actually uh, welcomed into a, a lab at Illinois a uh, Ben Lin if everybody remembers the pandemic we did a virtual one after a year off with uh, Jesse uh, Jeffries uh, Christopher Marvin gave a, a talk last year James Thorhoff, and then as we'll get to this here, we'll have a few uh, uh, speakers before the keynote speaker. So, so our first speaker for the symposium today is uh, Jennifer Fields, so I'll have her come down. She previously completed her master's degree in secondary education at Ball State, and is now currently completing her MS in chemistry, and is conducting organic chemistry research with Dr. Sundeep uh, Riot, and is planning to complete and defend her thesis, graduate this summer, exciting news, and then is currently interviewing for teaching, but not currently, but, not at the yeah, but is uh, interviewing for teaching positions at university college level. <coughs> I'll give you this if you want to start plugging. Oh, okay. All right. And without further ado, then I'll let uh, Jennifer uh, give you a little taste of the research that's done at Ball State. Do you want a mic? Um, I think I'm okay. You need to just turn on here. Okay. And then Okay, 
Um, so uh, I am Jennifer, and I am going to. Oops, that always happens to me. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research that I've been doing here over the past year and a half, um, which centers on designing coordination polymers that have tetrazolthiones as ligands. So first of all, what are coordination polymers? They are materials that consist of metal ions that are bridged together by organic molecules called ligands. Um, and they form arrays that can extend in one, two, or three dimensions. Um, if you have a three-dimensional one that is porous, those are also called metal organic frameworks, uh, or MOFs for short. And uh, the, regardless of their dimensionality, they have found numerous applications. Um, so it, they've had applications in catalysis, uh, drug delivery, gas storage, and separation, just to name a few. So coordination polymers that are based off of tetrazolthiones as ligands, uh, that's not been, been very well studied. In fact, if you take a look at the Cambridge Structural Database, uh, you get fewer than 400 unique structures back when you search for the basic skeleton of a tetrazolthione connected to any metal. Um, and many of those aren't just polymers, they're also complexes. So there's a lot of work that could still be done in this area. Uh, as I mentioned, in order to have a coordination polymer, you've got to have a ligand. And so for, uh, for us, the tetrazolthione <coughs> ligand is what we're trying to build these co coordination polymers with. And isothiocyanates are an important key building block in forming tetrazolthiones. Um, they react with sodium azide to form the tetrazolthione ring through a 1,3 dipolar cycloaddition. Once we form that ligand there, then we can go ahead and react it with the metal salt to form our coordination polymer. The, ligands itself, uh, the ligand itself can be either synthesized uh, independently or it can be synthesized in situ. So I'll talk about each of those methods uh, as we get a little further along. There are many methods that are uh, used for forming coordination polymers. I focus just on two, uh, one of which is the slow diffusion layering process here. So um, in that particular process, you will dissolve your metal and your ligand in different solvents um, that are different densities but are miscible with each other and you put your metal on the bottom um, and then there's a solvent gradient between uh, it and your ligand up at the top and then they slowly diffuse together over time and hopefully form crystals. The other method that I focused on is a solothermal method, uh, hydrothermal if your solvent is water. Um, and in that case, what you're doing is you're putting your materials into one of these stainless steel autoclaves and then putting it in an oven uh, for anywhere from hours to days at high temperatures to try to generate those crystals. So the uh, ligand, as I mentioned, can be prepared in situ, um, and that takes place um, in a fashion of the, the inside the autoclave. So you take your isothiocyanate, um, and you react that um, inside the container with azide as well. It's all going into the same container at the same time. So the ligand gets formed in situ from that 1,3 dipolar cycloaddition, and then that goes on to react with the metal salt that's also been placed in the container at the beginning, and hopefully you generate your coordination polymer crystals from that method. So using this particular method, the hydrothermal process where the ligand is formed in situ, um, I have used these isothiocyanates over here with a variety of metal salts, different combinations of the ligands and the salts under a variety of temperatures and pHs and reaction conditions. Um, as well as, um, I've also started incorporating some secondary ligands to change the architecture of the polymer. And so, uh, using this particular method, I've made over 70 different reaction attempts. And during those reaction attempts, we did manage to get some single crystals that we had taken up to Purdue for x-ray analysis. Uh, what we found is that some interesting chemistry is happening inside the hydrothermal container um, uh, under these conditions. So, uh, for example, we um, used this uh, bromophenyl isothiocyanate here, reacted it in two different reactions under similar reaction conditions, and we ended up forming two different amino tetrazoles. And these were both confirmed by x-ray analysis. So we, we got these structures from, uh, our crystallographer was able to tell us what these structures were. So when we have uh, tetrazolthiones, we already know from previous work that they undergo photochemical decomposition uh, to form this carbodiamide here. And so we believe that's probably what's happening under thermal conditions. It's thermally breaking down after the tetrazolthione ring has been formed um, and then forming this carbodiamide. 
So the potential pathway to the, each of those different amino tetrazoles that we just saw involves this, uh, this carbodiamide that's forming from that thermal decomposition, reacting with excess azide that happens to be in the reaction vessel to form this amine tetrazole here. And then that tautomerizes to the amino tetrazole product that we see. Also under these same conditions, we formed um, a guanidinium salt from one of the reactions. So again, it happened to, uh, it happened to occur with the bromophenyl isothiocyanate. Uh, this time we had a different salt here. But under similar conditions, we, we generated this, which was also confirmed with the x-ray analysis. And so the pathway to forming that guanidinium salt probably is taking place the same way that, um, that we were seeing the breakdown into the carbodiamide here. But we also suspect that there, there has to be bromoaniline being formed in the container as well, because that's the only way you can get to the, the guanidinium salt. So uh, what's likely happening is the carbodiamide is reacting with that bromoaniline and then producing this guanidinium salt that we found through crystal structure. As I mentioned earlier, um, the ligand can be synthesized independently and then reacted with the metal salt. So that's a two-step process. Step one is reacting the isothiocyanate with the sodium azide in order to get that 1,3 dipolar cyclo addition to occur to, to build your tetrazole thion ring. And then in step two, you can take that independently synthesized ligand and react it with a metal salt uh, through either the slow diffusion layering method that I showed earlier or through hydrothermal conditions as well. And so, as I mentioned, isothiocyanates are really key building blocks for forming these tetrazole thione uh, rings here through that 1,3 dipolar cyclo addition. And so, these are the ligands that I've been able to synthesize those so far. Uh, this top row, they've all been synthesized directly from their commer commercially available isothiocyanate. Uh, and then this fifth one here uh, was formed from the hydrolysis of this ethoxy carbonyl phenyl uh, tetrazole thione. So with uh, the ligand in hand synthesized independently, um, I've also run a series of hydrothermal reactions with uh, those top four ligands there. Uh, actually, top, that was the fifth one there. Um, with a variety of metal salts uh, under varying reaction conditions and, and at times incorporating the secondary ligands, this bipyridine up here and the uh, diiodotetrafluorobenzene. Also, I've incorporated dicyandiamide as a mineralizing agent to try to promote the crystal growth. And so with this particular process, there have been more than 25 reaction attempts. And now we get to some good news. So out of all those reaction attempts, we did have one uh, that formed single crystals that upon x-ray analysis showed that we had developed a uh, zinc-based two-dimensional coordination polymer. And so under hydrothermal conditions, this uh, benzoic acid substituted tetrazole thione uh, was mixed with uh, zinc salt and then the bipyridine as a secondary ligand to give us this structure here. And so in this particular structure, the zinc is, is, a, is a trigonal bipyramidal uh, arrangement or geometry, but it's distorted from what it typically is. Uh, and it coordinates to two tetrazole thione lings, uh, ligands, excuse me, uh, through the sulfur atom and also through the uh, two oxygens in the carboxylate. So you connect to your tetrazole thions through the sulfur on one and the carboxylate group on the other. Uh, and then the other two uh, connections that are left are the bipyridine. So this is a, a larger picture of that two-dimensional coordination polymer. So you can see its dimensionality and, it, uh, and the fact that these bipyridine uh, ligands tend to be the bridge between um, these, so that, that's what connects it in both directions. And then the final uh, method uh, was slow diffusion layering, so I've done quite a bit of that as well. Uh, again, with those same four ligands we saw um, just a moment ago and uh, a whole slew of different metal salts. Uh, and then I've also, also recently begun incorporating bipyridine into these as well, and that has been more than 50 different reaction attempts. Um, during the slow diffusion, there was actually also some unexpected chemistry that occurred. Um, and that was uh, that with this benzoic acid substituted tetrazole thione in the presence of manganese, we formed this disulfide, uh, also confirmed with um, the, the x-ray analysis that we got. 
So the potential pathway to that disulfide is uh, keeping in mind that this uh, tetrazole thione can exist uh, as tautomers. So we have the thiol version right here, and then that's what is um, in the presence of manganese uh, uh, was oxidized to form the disulfide. And there's a lot of um, a lot of literature that's precedent for, for transition metals being able to do this. This is just one of many articles that I chose to use as a reference. There's also some good news from the slow diffusion process as well. This time we have a zinc-based one-dimensional polymer that formed uh, with the bromophenyl tetrazothione and zinc. And so we got this structure over here. In this particular polymer, the zinc is tetrahedrally coordinated. Um, and the ligands are connected through uh, the sulfur, two sulfurs, and two nitrogen atoms. And so our ligands in this case are exhibiting a bidentate coordination mode because they're connecting to the zinc two different ways, through the sulfur and through the nitrogen atom, and it's what ends up uh, forming this one-dimensional chain here. So taking note of that particular structure, Previous work in the RIAT group uh, has shown uh, that we can get one-dimensional coordination polymers from both zinc and cadmium with the, uh, with the methoxyphenyl tetrazothione. And if you take a look, the, the uh, packing pattern of each of those is very similar. So it's, uh, it's promising that we were able to, to, uh, to find that same packing pattern with the one-dimensional polymer uh, that, that I was able to make. And then there are also some in the literature that have that same pattern. So I uh, definitely have more work to do before I'm finished. There are more tetrazothion ligands that I need to synthesize. Um, however, uh, with, and, and this, is the, this is the group right here that we uh, are working with that I want to synthesize. The one down here in the middle of the bottom row is the one I'm kind of currently working towards right now. The issue is that the, um, the isothiocyanate precursors to most, if not all of these, are not commercially available or they're super expensive. So I'm going to be um, synthesizing those in our own lab. So the remaining slides talk about my attempts to, to make those isothiocyanates so that I can get these tetrazole ions. Uh, so there's a variety of ways that you can uh, take uh, to, to make an isothiocyanate from an amine. Um, and so there's a variety of reactions that I've looked at. They all happen to go through this dithiocarbamate salt. And so what I've been doing recently is trying to take um, this particular amine here and uh, take it into the isothiocyanate form, and then I will eventually hydrolyze both of those to get the carboxylic acid groups on either side. So this table shows some of my efforts uh, up to date. And um, so variety of methods, these are the three that I've tried, varying some reaction conditions, and long story short, uh, most of it didn't do anything for me. I wasn't able to get the isothiocyanate from most of them, and then the one at the bottom using triphenylphosphine and the triple chloride only gave a trace amount of the isothiocyanate. So I s decided at that point to take a step back and think, okay, well, what if I can at least, can I at least get to the dithiocarbamate salt, and then maybe I can go someplace else with that? Because I had discovered um, uh, an article that did start from the independently synthesized dithiocarbonate carbonate salt and then takes it on to the isothiocyanate with um, desulfurization using iodine. So I, uh, I did start working on that and was able to turn this guy, this amine, into the, uh, the dithiocarbonate salt. And then I went ahead and later took that on uh, to the isothiocyanate and had some modest success with that. So that seems to be the path. Uh, that's going to work for the synthesis of those isothiocyanates so I can make those additional ligands. So to summarize, um, what we found is that the in situ synthesis during hydrothermal conditions is challenging and problematic because the tetrazole thion ring um, decomposes into that carbodiamide and then ends up giving us unexpected products like those amino tetrazoles or the guanidinium salt. Bipyridine has been useful as a secondary ligand that has been able to yield a two-dimensional polymer with the tetrazole thione and the metal ions. Um, and so in each case, I'm going to continue to use bipyridine to, uh, with other, uh, other metals and other ligands uh, to try to, to recreate those results. And with respect to the, t the degradation of that tetrazole thione um, ring, I think what we're going to do, I'm going to do is, is take lower temperatures under the hydrothermal conditions and see if I can avoid that decomposition in that way. 
Um, the slow diffusion layering method has been able to give us one-dimensional polymers, um, but we just have to be cognizant of the fact that the transition metals can um, catalyze that formation of the disulfides. So uh, we'll continue to work with that, with the varying uh, transition metals, and probably incorporate those secondary ligands in that as well. And then lastly, the isothiocyanates that are so key to forming the tetrazolthione rings can be prepared um, uh, from the dithio carbamate salts. So that can be synthesized independently uh, and then taken through iodine-mediated desulfurization in order to get the building block that we need. So I'd like to take a moment to thank my advisor, Dr. Raya, for her guidance during this work. Um, I'd also like to recognize the American Chemical Society for their financial support of this research. Shout out to Dr. Zeller at Purdue for his crystallographic analysis. Uh, and then I'd like to thank Ball State Chemistry Department for the opportunity to come here and pursue this second master's degree. And of course, thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. We got time for a couple questions. Dr. Lee. Yeah. So on your slides, number 12. Mm -hmm. So you have this you know, pH value like 2, 3, and 4. Mm -hmm. And then the hydrothermal synthesis use different temperatures. So I'm just wondering, I mean, how you decided to choose this temperature? Is it according to the literature? Oh, you just randomly do many experiments, you try to find optimal I mean, the temperature. So is there any correlation between the pH value and the temperature? Oh, they are just uh, coincidentally I mean, happening like that. Uh, so the pH value and the temperature both came as a result of literature. Uh, they're not necessarily connected to each other, uh, but there was literature where um, a group was working with tetrazole, uh, pyridyl tetrazoles, and they were finding success in growing crystals in the two to four pH range. So I thought that might be a, a good place to start with respect to, to my ligand. Um, and in terms of temperature, that's sort of been, um, you know, again, kind of guidelines from the literature, but then also just trying a different, thing, different various temperatures just to see what will grow crystals. Um, the crystals themselves are pretty elusive. It's like a, it's an art as well as a science, and it's been challenging to achieve single crystals to be able to find out the structures. Uh, they often turn into powders uh, in the hydrothermal containers, so it's been very hard to get actual single crystals, regardless of the temperature or conditions. Did you add some oven into the hydro, I mean, um, hydrothermal container? I do reaction. Did you add some oven to protect it, or just the air? Just air. Okay. Yeah, they're Thank usually and they're usually done in in water as the the solvent. Occasionally, on a mixture of water, ethanol, or DMF, things like that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Zukov. Yep. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. So based on your results and what you read, what factors do you think uh, guide the, this uh, coordination polymers to form chains versus 2D sheets versus 3D networks? Is there anything that pushes them one or the other way, whether guiding factors? Not that I've been able to see in terms of my work or in terms of literature that, that if you do it this way, it will always make a 1D, or if you do it this way, it will always make a 2D. It's just sort of uh, a roll of the dice to see what, what you're able to get. Have you seen any uh, correlation between the counter that you're using and the reactions? So if you've used, let's like, say, less coordinating uh, cations or anions, so these metal cations, does that make any difference to any of these reactions? Or it may. I have tried a, ver a variety of counter ions, like for example, we have zinc, uh, nitrate, perchlorate, acetate, chloride, and I've tried all of those. Unfortunately, I don't know that I can answer that question because we haven't obtained a single crystal from all of those to be able to tell if that matters. Um, again, it's mostly ends up being powders, but, no, but yeah. Is there a way that you analyze your reactions here? Besides if they make a crystal or not? Um, I have been doing, so if, if it ends up being just a powder, I've been filtering the powder off and drying it and then doing NMR, IR, um, things like that to see if there's anything we can tell from that. Any last questions? If not, thank uh, Jennifer again.
questions later. <laughs> okay. I'd like to pick your brain later. <laughs> All right. Our, our uh, second speaker today is going to be uh, Joel Moss. I'll have him come in and he can plug in here. So a little bit about Joel as he's getting set up here. So uh, Joel uh, came to us from Avon High School, not too far away from Indy. And uh, he, right now he's a senior chemistry major. He's been currently doing undergraduate research uh, with Dr. David Bombach in his lab and uh, doing analytical research. And so Joel will be graduating this spring with his undergraduate degree. And he's been accepted into the Master of Science in Forensic Science program at Arcadia University. So thank you for agreeing to give a talk today and tell us a little bit about the research in the Bombach group. So, take it away. So my name is Joel Moss, and I have been performing research in Dr. Wambach's lab. And so today I'll be talking to you guys about my research, which has been over the development of ionic liquid-based colorimetric sensors for forensic detection of controlled substances. And so to start off, I'll give a very brief introduction into forensic science, in case some of you may not know a whole lot about it. It can be thought of as science related to or used for the purposes of law. And so forensic scientists can have a variety of different roles, including being crime scene investigators, testifying in court as expert witnesses, as well as analyzing and interpreting evidence obtained. And lastly, if any of you have seen really any police drama show where forensic science is portrayed, this can lead to an idea called the CSI effect where the over-exaggerated portrayal of forensic science leads to uh, unrealistic expectations of what forensic science can actually do. And so controlled substance abuse incidences have increased significantly over the past several decades. Um, and in general, when samples are obtained by law enforcement and they're suspected of having controlled substances in them, they are taken back to a laboratory where they can be tested for identification as well as detection. And some of the techniques used widely by forensic scientists is gas chromatography mass spec, Vermont spectroscopy, and IR spectroscopy, including others. And although these are well-established techniques used to do this, there are some limitations such as they require trained personnel to prepare the samples as well as interpreting the data from using these techniques. And this can also be very time consuming, especially if there are backlogs of samples. And this is why there are screening methods. And so these are used for presumptive detection and identification of, of, sorry, of controlled substances. And uh, some of these include um, like colorimetric tests that are used on the field. And currently, these tests are limited in number, and those that are being used still have sensitivity and selectivity issues, which can result in false positive and false negative results. And so, as I mentioned, controlled substance abuse has increased, which has unfortunately led to a severe amount of drug overdose deaths in the United States each year. With being between 2002 and 2022, it's the amount of deaths have increased nearly five times with being over 107,000 in 2022. So one of the controlled substances that has gained popularity, unfortunately, is gamma hydroxybutyrate. <coughs> and this drug naturally occurs in the body in very small amounts and it can serve as a central nervous system depressant. And so depending on the size of the person as well as how much GHB they ingest, it can result in a variety of effects, including amnesia and consciousness and fatal overdoses with uh, very high amounts of ingestion. And unfortunately, some of these effects leave individuals susceptible to sexual assaults 
which is often why GHB is referred to as a date rape drug, because it is spiked in people's drinks and they unknowingly ingest it. And so this is why we want to develop ionic liquid-based sensors that can detect GHB as well as other controlled substances like cocaine. And we use ionic liquids because they have very tunable properties that are dependent on the cation and anion pairing. And we also want to address current limitations of sensors um, like the selectivity issues that can occur. And so we will determine absorbance and fluorescence intensity by UV vis and fluorescence spectroscopy with samples that have varying GHB concentration in it. And then once we do that, we will test our selectivity of our sensors. And today I'll be talking about the sensor that we want to detect GHB. And then in the future, we hope to develop paper-based devices for our sensors. So it is very, um, it's very useful for on-site screening. And you don't have to carry a kit full of different liquids. So to start off, we want to create the ionic liquid THP2 fluorescein. And so to do that, we do an anion exchange of trihexyl tetradecyl phosphonium fluoride with disodium fluorescein. And once we do this, we are able to produce a one millimolar solution, which was very bright yellow colored solution. And we are able to use a very small amount of this to create our nanoparticle solution by reprecipitation method. Once we've made our nanoparticle solution, we want to make sure that we've actually have nanoparticles in it. And so we determine the size by a technique called dynamic light scattering. And from this, we found that our size by intensity of particles in our solution were around 246 nanometers. And the PDI's polydispersion index, which essentially tells us how um, uniform the particle sizes are within our sample. And a value of 0.1 um, demonstrates that we have fairly uniform particle size. Once we do this, we moved on to actually adding various amounts of GHB to our nanoparticle sensor. And so you can see from this picture that there is a colorimetric change that is dependent on the GHB concentration. And so as we add more, we can see that it goes from more of a pink slowly into an orange colored solution, and then finally yellow. In addition, addition of more GHB past uh, 50 micrograms per milliliter of G, microliter of GHB, it still remains the seal of color seen on the right. And here is um, an example of fluorescence sensing of the GHB, where the top, these top two pictures of, are of our sensor just by itself. And under UV light, it is not fluorescent. And then once we add GHB, um, when we illuminate it with UV light, you can see here it is very fluorescent compared to it not being fluorescent at all. And so once we have these samples, we dilute them to one milliliter using methanol to ensure we have enough sample to analyze by UV vis. And so from here, you can see that um, when we just have our nanoparticles by themselves in this purple curve, um, once we add GHB to our sensor, it increases the absorbance. It's not a perfect uh, linear uh, increase each time we add more GHB, but it is uh, noticeably uh, increased compared to when our nanoparticles are just by themselves with 80 micrograms per milliliter of GHB being significantly higher. We also did two additional tests. You can see here in this pink and gray colored curves where we added more methanol to see if the solvent had any impact on the change in absorbance. 
and when we <coughs> sorry This for now. Um, we saw that adding additional methanol does not impact the absorbance at all, so it just suggests that it is the GHB that is causing this increase in absorbance. We analyzed the same samples to determine the fluorescence intensity, and we see similar trends where the presence of GHB increases the fluorescence intensity quite a bit and additional methanol to our to our samples does not impact the fluorescence <coughs> intensity. So as I mentioned we want to have our sensor to be very selective to GHB and so we briefly started testing this with in addition to adding GHB to our sensor, we added 1,4-butane diol, butyric acid, as well as propionic acid. And as you can see here, the butyric acid and propionic acid also have a carb carboxylic group. And the 1,4-butane diol also has the hydroxyl. So we prepared the samples the same way, where we, and we, compared 50 micrograms per milliliter of GHB to the same concentration of the potential interfering species. And we found that when we added butyric acid and propionic acid, it actually diminished the absorbance peak seen. And when we added 1,4-butane diol in this green curve, you can see it actually increased it a little bit but it is not as much as when we had added GHP, which is seen in this red curve. We also did one additional test where we diluted our sensor in ethanol, which can be seen in this turquoise color curve. And we did this to get an, like an initial idea of if testing samples in alcoholic beverages, which contain ethanol, um, could act as a interfering species of so. And we found that it did increase the absorbance about as much as when we'd added GHB. But it should be noted that the maximum wavelength was at 509 when GHB was present, and it was at 512 nanometers when we had diluted our sensor in ethanol. And we obtained similar results by analyzing our samples with fluorescence spectroscopy. The butyric acid and propionic acid diminish the fluorescence intensity almost entirely. Um, in this case, 1,4-butane diol actually decreased the fluorescence a little bit compared to when our sensor was just by itself. And then diluting our sensor in ethanol resulted in about the same increase in fluorescence intensity compared to when we had GHB present. So these are what our samples look like prior to dilution. We have our nanoparticles just by themselves, they're pink. When we had added GHB, it converted to a yellow colored solution. Uh, with 1,4-butane diol, it is very similar in color, but in person, it's more noticeably green rather than yellow. And then when we had added butyric acid and propionic acid, it actually decolorized our sensor entirely. And so in conclusion, we were able to synthesize the ionic liquid THP2 fluorescein, as well as its corresponding nanoparticles, which we found to have had a size of about 246 nanometers. Uh, using our sensor, we determine that it can detect GHB of low concentration, that being 10 to 80, to 80 micrograms per milliliter. And we also identified 1,4-butane diol as a potential interfering species 
because it looked very similar to when GHB was when GHB was added, as well as the absorbance increasing slightly. And so, in the future, we will want to continue testing our sensor in various beverages like alcoholic drinks, uh, as well as those in in biological samples such as saliva. And we will continue testing our sensor with more potential interfering species to continue seeing how selective our sensor is to DHP. Uh, one more thing, we want to develop, as I mentioned earlier, portable paper device so it can be used on the field uh, very easily without like uh, super trained personnel. And then we will continue working on developing sensors that can detect cocaine, which we have started uh, working on so far, and those with mixtures of cocaine and GHB, because that is being seen more often in uh, seed samples. So I'd like to thank Dr. Wambach and his research group, specifically Hannah and Caleb, who have also joined me in, in conducting this research as well as our collaborators in Ball State's Department of Chemistry. So thank you very much, and then are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, you were talking about uh, ionic liquid, but then you switch kind of uh, to nanoparticles. So what was, uh, that was uh, nanoparticle, you referred to uh, emulsion of this uh, ionic liquid in some other solvent, or what what's really was your kind of uh, yeah, we, uh, basis? In, 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 in what was your medium in which you studied this? Because it's not, uh, you said that it's, if it's ionic liquid, it's ionic liquid. If it's some nanoparticle, I, what kind of nanoparticle? Yeah, we, um, used the ionic liquid to make our nanoparticles of that ionic liquid. So that's basically emulsion of ionic liquid in, inside of what solvent? Water or water? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Can you specul speculate a little on the response difference between methanol and ethanol to your examples? Because you hit it with methanol, it didn't seem to make much of a difference, but methanol seemed to mimic GHB pretty strongly. Yeah, um, we're not quite sure yet. We, um, that was actually the only, we've ran that test a few times, um, but we haven't gone much further into that. That's something we will look at in the future. And then I saw you, did, you showed, the, on a few slides later, you showed where, like, uh, like the, yeah, right here. Yeah. So with your nanoparticles or with uh, your sensor, right? Yeah. There's no fluorescence from the UV. You have, G, the UV you have GHB and your sensor, lots of UV. How about GHB by itself? Did you, um, it didn't show you made sure of that one too, right? Any other questions? Joel, very, very good uh, talk. Uh, the, you know, from the chemistry perspective, I'm just curious, what do you think make that uh, nanoparticle recognizable to GHB specifically? What, what um, are the interactions that has that affinity build up? So we've speculated about this when GHB is dissolved in in a solvent. This um, OH of the carboxylic group is deprotonated, and so we speculate that this negative charge interacts with the positive charge of the of the phosphorylated ion. But we haven't, um, like I can't say. So the follow up to that, have you guys thought about testing GABA or GABA, GABA amino butyric acid, which would be positively charged on the other terminus? So it's neurotransmitter. Uh, we haven't tested that. Thank you. Yeah. 
But there's one we try to order, and, and uh, they, they need some licenses. Oh, sure. Yep. Summer. Do you need a license for GHP? If you want bigger quantities, right? GHP or the gamma uh, butyl lactone. Yeah. You definitely need license that's for those. One, yes. If you get, but if you buy, you know, what is it like one micro milligram per, milligram per yeah. liter or something, then yeah. that's, it's, that's okay. Right. We want to make sure we're not going to be in business. <laughs> yeah, right. We yeah. don't want to get anybody in trouble. Here. Okay. Well, thank you again, Joe. At this time, I've asked the uh, Morris family uh, if they could say a few words in memory of Bob. And uh, Bob's brother, Rick, has agreed to uh, share a few comments. So. Not smart to say, Bob. I'll give you the floor, Rick. So welcome everyone, my name is Rick Morris, brother of Bob. On behalf of the Morris family, we thank you for attending today's chemistry symposium in honor of my brother Bob. I would like to thank Dr. Samuelson, the chemistry department, uh, the graduate school, and the sponsored project administration for organizing and supporting this well-organized chemistry symposium. A very special thank you to Dr. Kyle Crabtree for traveling to Ball State to be the keynote speaker for today's symposium. Also, on behalf of the Morris family, I would like to thank the Ball State Foundation for the creation and support of the endowment fund number 1503. Bob was the first person on either of my parents' sides to graduate from college, let alone become a PhD chemist. My parents were extremely proud of him, as was I. I made my career in radiology, doing x-ray, CAT scans, and diagnostic ultrasound. Uh, if you knew Bob, you knew how humble he was. He loved teaching and helping others, regardless of what he was helping them with. He would be overjoyed to be here today with all of you attending the symposium. For those of you who did not know Bob, he held Bob Ball State very near and dear to his heart. One of his nicknames was Mr. Ball State. We also called him when he was provost for the short time and called him number two. That was his nickname, because he was number two in charge. He graduated, as, as Rob said, graduated from Ball State, summa cum laude in 1986 with a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry. He then went on to receive his PhD in inorganic chemistry from the University of Illinois, finished with a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of California, Berkeley. Soon after, he accepted a position as professor of chemistry here, just happened to be a position. My parents were still living in, in their house where we grew up in 1991. Since then, he became a tenured professor, chair of the chemistry department, associate provost for research and dean of the graduate school, <coughs> which he held the position for many years here at Ball State. In 2016, during his last few months at Ball State, he had been working in, in the position as the Ball State acting provost. He worked closely with Ball State's president at the time, Terry King, who was a chemical engineer from MIT. He was also involved in many other events and committees that he contributed greatly to. His reputation at Ball State was impeccable and well-respected. He devoted his entire life equally, his adult life, to his Ball State University chemistry and administrative career and to his family. I wish to all of you attending today's symposium that your chemistry endeavors are a lifelong success for you. It certainly was for Bob. And as Rob mentioned earlier at the beginning, on a side note, five years ago today, the Ball State Chemistry Department did a formal dedication ceremony of a planted tree and a plaque dedicated to Bob by the tree, located in the North Quad on the west side near the tennis courts. So, you know, that's all that I typed in everything. But the dude was smart. I'm smart. I was no comparison to my brother. I was telling Sharon Hogg earlier, I don't know where he got it. Because if you go to some of our family reunions on either side, I don't know, Rick, growing up in the 60s with Bob, we were Ricky Dean and Bobby Joe. That was our names as a 
as growing up as a kid. So I did pretty good. I usually what he's been he will be will have been gone eight years in November, and I usually tear up and cry. I did pretty good. So I'm proud of myself. <laughs> but anyway, so so listen to Dr. Crabtree, and I'm sure it'll be remarkable. I don't understand anything you guys say. All I know is K is potassium. That's all I got. <laughs> Dr. Kyle Crabtree was invited for the keynote address. I'll give you a little background on uh, his past on why we thought this would be a good speaker for Morris Symposium. Uh, Dr. Crabtree is an alum of Ball State, very similar as we just heard about uh, uh, Bobby Jones, and uh, was a student actually when Bob was the chairperson of the department. So, and Kyle did his undergrad research with James Poole did some physical organic chemistry and graduated in 2006. Uh, he went on to earn his PhD in chemistry at the University of Illinois, also very similar uh, to Bob. Uh, Kyle went on to do his postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for astrophysics. And with his astrophysics background and his PhD, he uh, was hired and went out to the chemistry department at UC Davis, where he is now currently an associate professor and doing research on astrochemistry, microwave spectroscopy, and low temperature kinetics. Thank you for accepting our invitation, Kyle, and uh, awesome. traveling here to uh, speak. Thank you, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> give me a moment, I'll try to sort out the slide issue. And uh, sorry in advance for my voice, I woke up this morning and it was gone. It's mostly come back today, but um, I, I may need to take a drink of water for a second um, every now and then. I'm just going to try to fix my projector real quick. It is a real privilege for me to be back here at Ball State. Um, as Dr. Samuelson said, um, I was here while uh, Dr. Morris was the chair of the department, and I had the privilege to have him as my uh, professor for inorganic chemistry um, when I when I took the class uh, here at Ball State. And I learned, I mean, I learned many things from uh, from Dr. Morris, of course. Uh, but two things like really stood out to me that I remember. One, I was telling some of you today. I, I was going back looking through my. I still have some of my old materials and like homework and exams from that class. And I remember he made us memorize the periodic table, including like all the spellings of the elements. It was in his class that I learned, as a senior chemistry major, that I had been misspelling fluorine my entire life <laughs> up until that point. I had been spelling it flowering. But I, got, I missed that question on his exam and <laughs> saved myself from embarrassment in the future, so I'm grateful for that. But he also uh, taught uh, group theory in the class. It was my first exposure to sim molecular symmetry and group theory. And that remains one of my very favorite topics. I s still use it in my group's research, and I, and I now teach group theory in my physical chemistry class at UC Davis. Um, uh, Dr. Morris was also pretty excited when I, when I told him that I was accepted into the PhD program at UIUC. Um, and when I went there, he encouraged me to go meet with uh, Dr. Girolami right away. And I did, and I got some very good advice from him about joining research groups. Well, from since I was here at Ball State, I've started getting into a very different field. I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, about what it is I do now at UC Davis, but also a little bit about how I got there um, from when I got my start here at Ball State. So my group's research uh, these days is on astrochemistry. <clears throat> Broadly speaking, astrochemistry is about understanding the chemical evolution of matter in the universe. We primarily focus on material outside our solar system. So we want to look at objects like diffuse clouds, dense clouds, the, the birthplaces of stars, protoplanetary disks, and even evolved stars, dying stars, and throughout all of these different um, environments in space, categorize what is the molecular inventory, 
how are molecules made and formed under those circumstances? What's the interplay of chemistry and physics? And ultimately, we'd like to under, understand to a certain extent how the chemistry that we see in space may be related to the origin of life on Earth or the prospects for finding life elsewhere in the universe. <clears throat> As you may imagine, this, sits, uh, this field sits at the interface of chemistry, astronomy, and physics. And there are three main types of activities that go on. We have observational astronomers who are, of course, looking using telescopes at what is out there in space, um, gathering the data. We have theoreticians and modelers who are trying to synthesize information about what we know from chemistry and physics and perhaps uh, reproduce uh, astronomical observations, make simulations and make predictions about those objects. And then the area where I primarily work is in what's broadly called laboratory astrophysics, where in general terms, we are measuring the kind of experimental data needed to both in, uh, understand and interpret data coming to Earth from, uh, from these radio <coughs> telescopes. How do we know, how do we convert from these, the, the lines or features that we see in, in radio telescope spectra, turn those into mo molecular identities, molecular abundances. We try to make the measurements needed to do that, and we also provide physical data that's needed to feed into models of chemistry uh, happening outside our solar system. This was not stuff that I got into at Ball State. As a student at Ball State, I didn't know that this field existed in the first part. So um, I graduated from here in 2006. Uh, as, as Dr. Samuelson said, I worked with uh, Dr. James Poole while I was here. Um, I did uh, azide photochemistry. Um, so we were synthesizing some of these azetopyridine compounds. Um, doing uh, various photochemistry and um, doing some UV vis spectroscopy in liquid nitrogen cooled samples to try to see if we could capture uh, these nitrine intermediates. And I mean, I'm really, I'm really grateful for my, uh, for my time here at Ball State, my exposure to undergraduate research. And one of the things that I would say to undergrads currently doing research is that you know, getting in there and discovering what you like and what you don't like is really important for your future. I discovered both things that I really liked and things that I didn't like through this research process. And, and I kind of learned for myself that I didn't want to be an organic chemist. I, I could do synthesis, but it wasn't what got me excited about going into the lab every day. What got me excited about going into the lab every day was this part, when we got to take apart UV biz and, and rebuild it with a liquid nitrogen uh, cooled cuvette system, when I got to work up the data from these uh, uh, photochemistry experiments. I really decided that when I went to do my PhD, I wanted instrumentation to be a big part of what I did, rather than the, the wet chemistry. So when I uh, enrolled in the PhD program at the University of Illinois, I was largely agnostic to the kind of chemistry that I would, that I would do. I could have joined an organic group as long as there was a lot of instrumentation and, and like reaction mechanism type work. But I ended up going in a different direction. I ended up meeting uh, Ben McCall, who was building an instrument there at the time called SCRIBES, Sensitive Cooled Resolved Ion Beam Spectroscopy. So he said, like, we're gonna take a supersonic expansion plasma source and we're gonna extract an ion beam, overlap it with a laser that's bouncing back and forth between a set of mirrors making an optical cavity, and then we're gonna steer that beam into a time of flight mass spectrometer. And the purpose is to do high resolution infrared spectroscopy of molecular ions that are important for astrochemistry. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, I didn't know what an ion beam was. Like, I was aware of lasers, but didn't really know how they worked or what they did. Um, all of, we didn't really have mass spec much at the time here at Ball State, so I'd learned about it in my, in my instrumentation class, but I'd never gotten to do it. And so I, I was fascinated when I went into the lab and discovered that this was just stuff that they were building. Like they built plasma sources, they were building their lasers, they were building this whole instrument. It looked like a physics lab rather than a chemistry lab. And astrochemistry was really exciting to me because as a kid, like, I mean, like many people, like astronomy is often kind of people's first love in science. We have like the eclipse coming up here soon where people are, you know, are excited and motivated about learning about astronomical phenomena. And then I learned that there was this field that existed where I could combine my kind of childhood enjoyment of astronomy with you know, the, the chemistry degree that I had earned. And I thought, this sounds great. And honestly, 
I don't think I'm ever going to get a job that lets me do astrochemistry because, like, frankly, there aren't that many of those jobs. But I bet the experience that I get building instrumentation is going to carry me along a long way. And so that's why I got into it. Um, and one of the things that we studied a lot were molecular ions. And I wanted to just take a moment here to explain something about astrochemistry and why we cared about molecular ions. And that is that most environments where we see molecules in space are cold. Their temperatures tend to be between like 10 and 50 Kelvin. And so at 10 to 50 Kelvin, if a chemical reaction has an activation barrier, then from like the Arrhenius equation, we would predict that chemical reaction rates are going to be very slow and get even slower as we drop the temperature. And so this is just like a, like a, a simple little like high, high temperature limit type plot where I've just set an activation energy of 10 kilojoules per mole and plotted a relative rate coefficient versus the high temperature limit. And as we drop down to a temperature of 10 Kelvin, if we have a very low activation energy of 10 kilojoules per mole, the rate coefficient has dropped by a factor of about 50 orders of magnitude. Very, very slow. Even on astronomical time scales, that's slow. Even if we just have like a one kilojoule per mole barrier, this is barely even an activation barrier at all. The reaction rate by the time you get down to 10 Kelvin could be down by about five orders of magnitude. So in order for chemistry to happen in space, we need reactions that do not have activation barriers, barrierless reactions. And ion neutral reactions often are barrierless. And so you can build up this kind of network of ion molecule reactions, this kind of like tree-like structure that starts from cosmic ray ionization of H2 to make H3 plus an extremely strong acid. H3 plus will protonate almost anything it comes into contact with. If it protonates carbon, you can get up to CH3+, which can branch off and make a whole bunch of, of, uh, of more interesting so-called complex organic molecules. And you might even be able to go through CH5+, to eventually get to methane and start forming carbon-carbon bonds. And this sort of uh, reaction network was thought for a long time to be the primary means by which complex molecules formed in space. So many of the molecules that have been seen in space are thought to have been formed through this kind of chemistry. So this is why we were so interested in studying molecular ions. I did get to build plenty of, uh, of spectrometers during my PhD. Um, I just pulled out this one slide I did. I spent a healthy fraction of my PhD thesis studying this chemical reaction up here, H3 plus plus H2, the products of which are H3 plus and H2. I like to joke that I got a PhD in chemistry for studying a reaction whose products are the same as the reactants. This is a proton scrambling reaction. And we're able to monitor the progress of this reaction by monitoring the nuclear spins of H3 plus using infrared spectroscopy. So we would do infrared spectroscopy and see how the ortho to para ratio of H3 plus was modified by reacting with H2 in a liquid nitrogen cooled hollow cathode plasma cell, among other things. So by monitoring this, we were able to back out the reaction kinetics of this proton scrambling process and then apply that in interstellar clouds where this reaction is the primary means by which proton uh, uh, scrambling happens in H3+. After finishing my PhD, uh, PhD there in 2012, I was fortunate to get a postdoctoral fellowship at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics um, in Cambridge. Uh, and so I went out there uh, and worked with uh, Mike McCarthy and I was excited about getting out there because I got to learn about the technique of microwave spectroscopy. In microwave spectroscopy, we're probing the pure rotational spectra of molecules. Um, and the reason I was so excited about this is that if we look at the history of molecules that have been detected in space, about 90%, and these days probably close to 95%, are detected by means of rotational emission. So molecules sitting out in space rotate, give off light as they rotate, and we use the light, this uh, microwave rotational emission of molecules as a characteristic fingerprint to identify them in space. And so most of these uh, molecules, you get, we have like all sorts of weird things in space, these like long chain anions like C6H minus, so these long cyanopolyhines, HC11N, uh, we have buckyballs, uh, we have various metal containing species, lots of radicals, cyclic compounds. Um, we have familiar things um, like water or glycol aldehyde. We have very exotic things, cyclic C3H2, cyclopropenylidene. So it's a very exotic and non-equilibrium environment and most of that is probed through rotational spectroscopy. 
Now the reason for that uh, gets back to some undergraduate physical chemistry, some stuff that I learned a little bit here at Ball State. That's that if we take a molecule and we write down its molecular structure, we can calculate for any three-dimensional structure three rotational constants A, B, and C, which are just directly related to the principal moments of inertia, so the masses of the nuclei and where they're located relative to the center of mass. If a molecule has a dipole moment, that molecule is going to emit light that corresponds to um, transitions between its uh, quantum rotational levels, and we can write down the first order rotational Hamiltonian for a molecule that's just a direct function of these three rotational constants. The upshot is that A, B, and C are sensitive to structure. That structure determines the rotational energy levels and therefore the exact transition frequencies. Rotational spectra are an extraordinarily selective and specific molecular fingerprint. We can associate a rotational spectrum with a specific three-dimensional structure with very little ambiguity. And this is why it's so important for astrochemistry. The downside is that molecules have to be in the gas phase because they need to be free to rotate. So what does this look like? Um, this is the galactic center. So there's a black hole somewhere around here. This is a composite image in, um, in 21 centimeter light x-rays and visible light. Over here is the Sagittarius region, and there's a source over here called Sagittarius B2, which is a very famous uh, source that's rich, a ma site of massive star formation, lots of complex molecules. We take something like the Green Bank Telescope, which I got to visit as a graduate student, point it at Sagittarius B2, and then either by looking at the uh, emission of light, or in this case, the absorption of uh, black body radiation given off by dust, we can see absorption lines that we can match up to the experimental spectrum that we took in the lab for uh, a molecule. So this is an example of this molecule e cyanomethanamine, which was thought to be a, a potential precursor to the synthesis of adenine in space-like conditions. Um, I was part of the team for detecting this molecule in space. We went in the laboratory, produced this molecule, measured its rotational spectrum, and then went and lined up the astronomical spectrum against the laboratory spectrum, accounting for the velocity difference between Earth and Sagittarius B2, and we're able to see these absorption features right at where the laboratory, uh, laboratory transitions were. So even though Sagittarius B2 is many light years from us, we know that E cyanomethanamine is present there, and we can even use the, um, the intensity of the absorption to quantify and determine uh, physical information about the environment, temperature, density, and so on. So as a postdoc, um, I specialized in uh, making exotic molecules, things like this uh, prototypical Creedy intermediate. Here's dihydroxycarbene, a couple of silicon nitride compounds, and this very strange one, um, isonitrosyl hydroxide, uh, which has an extraordinarily long oxygen-oxygen bond. So we would produce these molecules and then do isotopic substitution spectroscopy to come up with very precise molecular geometries. So we could plug in different isotopes and measure to high precision, even sub-milliangstrom precision, bond lengths, um, bond angles of molecules in the gas phase. And this just kind of reinforces why rotational spectroscopy is so structure specific. We can even determine the three-dimensional structure of a molecule from rotational spectroscopy. So after a couple of years at the CFA, I came out to UC Davis, and um, they hired me, I guess, letting me do more astrochemistry. So it kind of worked out that way. So um, Davis, if you don't know, is located kind of on the way from Sacramento to San, uh, to San Francisco. So we're just outside the Bay Area, kind of in the northern part of the Central Valley, which is a major agricultural uh, production region for the US. Honestly, Davis feels like a Midwest college town. It felt like Champaign-Urbana transplanted onto the West Coast, just with better weather, palm trees, more bikes. Um, but if you go outside Davis, I mean, it's just like driving outside Muncie. You're in farmland. Um, a lot more diverse farmland, though. We, we have a lot more different kinds of crops other than corn and soybeans and tomatoes. But um, yeah. So Davis is located there. Um, it's a really nice place to live and study. Um, you know, it's a beautiful campus. Uh, the city's really nice, and if you are going to be applying to grad school, I'd encourage you to check us out. Our program's got about 250 or so grad students, about 700 undergrad chemistry majors, give or take. Our, our TAs and graduate student researchers get about a $40,000 a year stipend. It's gone up a little bit. I think it might be close to 42 or 43 now. Um, and at the upper end right now, it's like 48. Uh, we don't require the GRE or anything. Um, so our application deadline each year is December 1st. Check us out if you're thinking about grad school. 
we have research in you know, all kinds of major areas of chemistry. My group has been active in four main areas uh, for uh, experimental and also theoretical laboratory astrophysics. Um, so we've done, we, we do a lot of work with radicals, uh, doing both microwave and infrared spectroscopy of radicals in the gas phase. We have an experiment set up for doing low temperature kinetics, trying to measure the rates of chemical reactions at temperatures of say 20 Kelvin. And we've also uh, done some work on vacuum ultraviolet photo dissociation. What I'm going to focus on today is primarily our microwave work. So I'm going to tell you like one story that we've completed and then show you a couple of in progress things that we're working on. So this first uh, project on microwave spectroscopy of nitrogen-containing radicals was initiated by my first grad student, uh, Dr. Summer Johansson, who's now um, at Sandia National Labs. Um, and it focuses on uh, these two um, uh, cyanovinyl radicals as well as the uh, uh, radical derivatives of purity. We're interested in these because uh, meteorites that crash to Earth contain interesting biologically relevant molecules that are of extraterrestrial origin. We know that they're of extraterrestrial origin because the isotope ratios, the amount of carbon-13 to carbon-12, or nitrogen-15 to nitrogen-14, don't match isotope ratios here on Earth. So these molecules, or at least the, the raw materials that went, to their, went into their synthesis, were delivered with the meteorite. And so the question is, how, how did these molecules get to be present? So there are nitro, a lot of these are nitrogen heterocycles that we have pulled out. However, despite careful searches, no nitrogen-containing heterocycle has been detected in the interstellar medium. We've only seen these things on meteorites as they've been delivered to Earth. So how are they, how are they made? Are they made in the gas phase and they just deposit quickly onto meteorite parent bodies? Are precursors made in the gas phase, deposit onto meteorite parent bodies, and then are processed uh, through some sort of condensed phase process? This is all a very open question. My group specializes in gas phase work, so we sought to investigate potential new mechanisms that we could explore for the synthesis of these compounds under space-like conditions. And as I said before, we're looking for reactions that don't have activation barriers because Places where these things would be made would need to be cold by necessity. And if there are activation barriers in a reaction, it's probably not going to be important. So my student at the time brought to me this paper that was alleging that this reaction of cyanovinyl plus vinyl cyanide, or acrylonitrile if you prefer. We, we prefer vinyl cyanide. I think it sounds cooler. Um, this reaction was supposedly making pyridine under single collision conditions in the gas phase. And density functional theory calculations suggested that the pathway was barrierless. There's this, this little submerged barrier that's just calculated to be under the energy of the reactants. And if this is the case, this could be a viable pathway in space. Vinyl cyanide is a well-known astronomical molecule, so we thought, well, is, vinyl si is, is, is this cyanovinyl radical present in space? The answer at the time was, nobody knows because there was no spectroscopic data available for this beta cyanovinyl radical in the literature. So we thought, why not go after these guys? So cyanovinyl has three uh, main isomers, depending on which of the three hydrogens are removed. This alpha cyanovinyl radical had actually been previously measured. It was in a paper that was entirely in Japanese. Um, so we Fortunately, had a, an undergrad at the time who spoke enough Japanese to help us like, piece through this paper. But these two beta isomers um, had not been measured. And so these tables of constants are kind of our microwave spectroscopy lingo and communicating what the structure of the molecule is and what kinds of uh, intramolecular interactions are going on that give rise to the, the features. I won't, I won't go into too much detail about exactly what those mean. So how we got started is uh, we started by doing high-level ab initio quantum chemical calculations. These are couple cluster calculations, CCSD parentheses T, uh, with uh, fairly large double and triple zeta basis sets. We would first use the quantum chemical calculations to predict the structures to high accuracy. We need high accuracy structures to come up with predictions of the rotational constants. So again, just the rotational constants depend on the structure. The one slight complication is that molecules, even at absolute zero, are still vibrating. There is uh, a little bit of vibrational motion, even at absolute zero. And because 
molecules have a slight amount of vibrational and harmonicity, the structure of a molecule in its ground vibrational state is a little different than its equilibrium structure at the minimum of the potential energy surface. So we do a treatment of that with a slightly lower level of theory to come up with vibrational corrections to the, the rotational constants to come up with more accurate predictions of the rotational constants that we should observe in our spectrum. The technique that we use for, for studying these radicals is called a cavity Fourier transform microwave spectroscopy. So we have a large vacuum chamber. Inside that vacuum chamber, we place a couple of microwave mirrors. These are like 14 inch diameter mirrors, so like huge things. And we introduce our sample by taking, say, some vapor of vinyl cyanide, diluting it in neon, and then we pass it through a pulsed valve, making a little pulse that goes through uh, a region where there are a couple of electrodes that we put at high voltage. This uh, pulsing of gas through the, the uh, electrode region creates a plasma. That plasma um, unleashes chemistry in some uncontrolled manner, starts ripping apart molecules, breaking bonds, doing all sorts of stuff. And we hope that one of those many things that happens is that one of those hydrogens is going to be removed from vinyl cyanide, giving us the radical. And then we allow that plasma to supersonically expand into a vacuum chamber which rapidly cools the sample down to a temperature of say, you know, two Kelvin, five Kelvin, something like that, and rapidly drops the density so that we can stop chemical reactions from happening. Radicals tend to be pretty reactive, so if we have a high density around, they'll tend to react, but so by doing the supersonic expansion, we can sort of trap these radicals in the gas phase. We then hit them with a pulse of microwave radiation that's nearly on resonance with this cavity, uh, the molecules, after being polarized, uh, emit a free induction decay. This is very similar in concept to NMR spectroscopy. And the Fourier transform of that free induction decay gives us a spectrum. And in this case, we've got this little double peak line shape because we've got molecules traveling at a supersonic velocity inside a cavity where light is bouncing back and forth in two directions. So we get a splitting in the line from the Doppler effect because we've got these two velocities. So, in order for us to find a new molecule for the first time, this, uh, we, we need to kind of, we need to go through and, and do spectroscopy, but with this cavity instrument, we can only look at kind of one frequency at a time. We've got to scan bit by bit. So we use our theoretical predictions to come up with an energy level diagram. So this is an illustration of, a uh, simplified uh, illustration of an energy level diagram for, uh, for the cyanobinyl radical. And we're trying to determine three constants, A, B, and C, from the experimental spectrum, which means we need, a, at minimum, three measurements. We need to measure three specific lines, and then we could fit those three lines to three unknowns and be all good. Not really, we, we want to fit more than that, but that's a starting point. So we targeted these three transitions. So we call them 101 to 000, 111 000, and 202101. It's just identified by the quantum numbers associated with each rotational level. So we're going to go and we're going to look for these. We have predictions from our calculations about where to find them. The other slight complication is that these radicals have lots of internal sources of angular momentum in addition to molecular rotation. And so the electron spin will couple with the rotational motion of the molecule, giving us a spin rotation interaction. There's a nitrogen nucleus, some hydrogens. And so instead of seeing just one line, we're expecting to see kind of a mess of lines in this area that arises from all of the details of the angular momentum coupling inside this molecule. So we set up the experiment. We started scanning, scanned from about 10,100 to 10,350 megahertz in frequency. Here was our prediction, and there were two clusters of unidentified lines that were close to the prediction. We also found some lines of vinyl isocyanide, so somehow flipping around that CN. We found this um, cyanoaline molecule that was made in the discharge somehow. Those had been previously reported, but these two sets of lines had not been. And it turns out that this cluster of lines right here did come from the cyanovinyl radical, so our prediction was pretty spot on. But to know that, we had to do a few tests. So I'm gonna zoom in on one of those lines. Here's just uh, measuring one of those lines. And what we could do is we could turn off our electrical discharge. If this is from a radical, if we take away our discharge, we should no longer be breaking any bonds, and indeed the signal goes away. We don't have radical anymore. We can also apply a magnetic field. Radicals are paramagnetic. Their rotational energy level structures are perturbed by application of a magnetic field, and we can perturb the intensities of these transitions by inducing additional splittings and, and phase effects 
on the spectrum. So we can tell that these lines came from a radical. We can then, with that knowledge, say, all right, well, if that was our 101 to 000, 000, 000 transition, the 202 to 101 should be about twice the frequency, just under two times the frequency. We set up a scan, we predicted 20,394, and we found another similar cluster of lines just below that, as we would expect. So this was good. Um, we've got two transitions, but this third one is a little tricky because its predicted frequency is outside the spectral range of our instrument. Our instrument only goes up to about 40 gigahertz. This is predicted to be somewhere above 50. So we brought a second technique to bear called microwave-microwave double resonance. And in this technique, we observe one transition with our cavity microwave spectrometer. So we can look at this 101 to 000 transition. We can bring in a second microwave transition. And if the frequency of the or a second microwave source, and if the frequency of that source is resonant with another transition that shares a common quantum state with the one we're monitoring, we can destroy the coherence. So we can have our spectral line disappear. And we can plot out a quasi-absorption spectrum by varying this second frequency. And this allows us to map out transitions that are outside the range of the instrument. And we know that those transitions are coming from the same molecule with the specific quantum state linkage. So we know that we know that we know that these lines that we're seeing are from the same molecule and confirms our, our assignment of the lines. And so with those three in place, we're able to come up with experimental A, B, and C values and effectively predict most of the rest of the spectrum. So then we can just kind of go on and knock out line by line. We know exactly where to look. We find it. We were able to uh, do this for the cis beta cyanovinyl uh, molecule and the trans molecule. And so we published this, uh, I guess, back in 2019 now. So we were able to identify these molecules. And um, so far, people have not yet looked for these two in space because we need, to take the uh, we need to take these measurements up to higher frequency for some higher frequency radio telescopes. But the alpha cyanovinyl isomer, the other one, was just detected last year. So we feel, feel pretty good about these two. Uh, being detected sooner rather than later. At Davis, um, we've moved beyond just cavity spectroscopy and we use this newer technique called chirp pulse Fourier transform microwave spectroscopy. So I said before that with this cavity instrument, we could only look at one frequency at a time. In this chirp pulse spectroscopy, we can look at a huge chunk. So instead of looking at just one frequency, I can look at the entire 26 to 40 gigahertz region of the spectrum at a time. <coughs> And this is game-changing for rotational spectroscopy because it would take about four weeks of continuous measurement with this instrument to cover that same frequency range. So this is what we're doing at UC Davis. Um, we built an instrument like this. Um, we put uh, a test molecule in. This is a methyl terp-butyl ether, just some random compound that we found that had a dipole moment. It gave us a really beautiful uh, spectrum here. So we, we apply a, a chirp of microwave radiation uh, we detect a free induction decay. It works very, very similarly to the previous experiment that I described. But this time we can see this whole spectrum kind of in a single 15 microsecond measurement that we can then repeat to build up after, uh, to, to improve the signal to noise ratio. And like I can, uh, you know, we could go into the, the details of the instrument, but um, we use an arbitrary waveform generator and a high bandwidth digital oscilloscope. Those are the two main tools that make this possible, together with a, a very high power microwave amplifier. So this NTBE molecule, just to, to show it off, we measured um, uh, two different backing pressures, which gave us two different temperatures in our, in our spectrum. And just kind of showing some of the, the spectral detail that we can get in this measurement, you know, we can really zoom in and zoom in and see individual isolated spectroscopic lines. The spectrum of NTBE has somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 1,300 individual spectral lines that we're able to identify and assign. Um, during the pandemic, we got much more involved in uh, quantum chemical calculations, and we, we did some new uh, calculations on the, the pyrillyl and pyridyl radicals to predict their rotational spectra. So we published these in 2000, uh, 2021 and 2022, respectively. And we installed a similar kind of supersonic expansion discharge source um, into our chirp pulse instrument so that we could go look for the pyridyl radicals. So uh, here's what this, here's uh, kind of work in progress data. Um, on the bottom here is a spectrum of pyridine that we've put into our instrument. And on the top is that same spectrum, but when we turn on the electrical discharge. So we try to break some bonds and make something happen. 
And so here in red, I've highlighted new lines that show up when we turn on the discharge that weren't present before. And if you look through there, like, okay, there's something new there, that's HC3N. It, it may not look like much, but right now, you can't see the noise level in this spectrum. If I zoom in, instead of going minus 40 to plus 60, I go minus one to one. Now all of a sudden, it looks like there's quite a bit more detail. There are lots and lots of new lines that have shown up that weren't there before. But you still can't see the noise level. I have to zoom in by another factor of 10 before you can actually get down to where the noise level in the spectrum is. There are lines everywhere in this spectrum. I think we counted about 3,500 new lines that show up when we turn on the discharge. And these come from anything that we can think of that we can make from taking pyridine and ripping apart bonds and, and recombining those elements in whatever combination. So this is a massive now data science problem. We have to try to sort through here and find out what are all of these different pe peaks. And in there, are there any that may correspond to the pyridyl radical? And this may seem like a hopeless task, but really if we zoom in, these are individual isolated lines. It's not like it's just a big blob here. But this just kind of demonstrates like, the power and potential of rotational spectroscopy. We can really go through and analyze this stuff. And this looks a lot like spectra that we get from radio telescopes. So we're working with similar kinds of data analysis challenge. So this is work in progress. And I'll take just a couple minutes to highlight a, a, a few other things that we're working on. Um, this is the current uh, rotational spectroscopy team. They are working on this discharge project, but we've also gotten into some interesting work on intramolecular dynamics of some of these nitrogen-containing uh, ring molecules. So recall that I, we were talking about these nitrogen heterocycles. Many of these are, are uh, rather unsaturated species, but there are several um, um, saturated nitrogen-containing heterocycles that often have ketone and methyl or ethyl functional. And so we have recently um, undertaken some investigations of saturated nitrogen-containing cyclic structures that were, are simpler but inspired by some of the structures that are present on these meteorites. None of these molecules have been studied by rotational spectroscopy um, um, in, in the lab in the, in the past. So none of these have been able to be the target of astronomical searches. These, though, are all commercially available. We don't, we don't do synthetic chemistry in my lab. We have some, some collaborators who may be able to synthesize these for us, but we can buy all of these from Sigma Alderates or TCI Chemicals. And in collaboration with a new professor at Harvey Mudd College out on the West Coast, we've added a heated reservoir to our source so that we can take solid samples or samples that have a low vapor pressure and gently heat them into the gas phase, maybe 100 Celsius or 200 Celsius. Uh, to get some vapor so that we can uh, do spectroscopy. So we've done, say, succinamide here. The top is the experiment, on the bottom is our simulation of the spectrum after doing, the, the, um, doing all of the analysis. Like rock solid detection here, we're ready, for, you know, ready to write that up and get it out the door. Here's 5-methylperolidone, another molecule. We can see again, experiment, simulation things line up pretty nicely. But things get interesting if we start looking in at the details. And to, to say why, I want to take a moment and, like, I'm a p-chemist now, I, I like showing things from p-chem. So this is a, a harmonic oscillator problem. We have a, this is a, like a classical model for molecular vibration. So if we have, uh, you know, we have some reduced mass, we have some bond length, we, we can model the potential energy as a function of displacement by a parabola, and we can solve this, uh, this Hamiltonian. We come up with energy levels that look something like this, h bar omega times v plus one half, where v is the vibrational quantum number. These are evenly spaced lines. The wave functions are these Hermite uh, polynomials multiplied by a Gaussian function. This is good undergrad p. This is the model for molecular vibration, and it works really, really well most of the time, as long as when the molecules vibrate, the nuclei stay pretty close to their equilibrium positions. And that has been the case for most of the molecules I've shown you up until this point. But there are some molecules, like methyl terpbutyl ether, where that approximation doesn't hold. In methyl terpbutyl ether, this terminal methyl group over here, this OCH3, the barrier for it to rotate is fairly low, and it turns out that the harmonic oscillator model breaks down. This just little harmonic-like part here just isn't enough to truly model the vibrational dynamics here. And so it turns out that if you solve the full uh, problem, 
if we take a, um, a situation where the internal rotation barrier is super high, we end up with what looks like a harmonic oscillator solution, just three of them that are all degenerate. So that could be like, you think of the, the methyl group is kind of locked into place, there are three different possible orientations, but those are all degenerate with each other, and who cares, it's boring. But as we start decreasing the barrier height, watch this V equals three level, all of a sudden, that degeneracy of these three levels becomes lifted for these higher states. All of a sudden, there's an energy difference that we can observe in the spectrum. And if we keep going and take this down even lower, that degeneracy lifting starts affecting the V equals one and even the V equals zero level. I, I haven't zoomed in enough to really show it there, but you can start to see that the degeneracy down there is noticeably broken. Even in this intermediate case, the degeneracy breaking, even though it's small, causes a notable effect in our spectrum. And it looks something like this. So um, if we were to simulate with a regular rigid rotor, we would get a spectrum that kind of looks like the dotted lines that I've graphed here. But in methyl butyl ether, we actually have to add some extra terms that account for the vibrational angular momentum and the vibrational potential energy of that methyl internal rotation. It's like a, the molecule as a whole is rotating, but there's another source of angular momentum from the methyl group spinning like a top. And we have to treat both of those sources of angular momentum together. So we do that by coupling the angular momentum operators here and including the, the rotational, <coughs> sorry, the torsional potential energy, the so-called V3 here. And what it does in effect is it splits each of these lines into two components, one of asymmetry and the other of E symmetry, that came from those uh, vibrational wave functions. And the upshot is that the smaller this V3 is, the bigger this splitting and the larger effect it has on the spectrum. So if we look at this, this another example, in methyl caprolactam, this is another example where zoomed out here, everything looks great. But if we zoom in, there's actually a lot of interesting intramolecular dynamics uh, going on from this uh, CH3 rotation. So this figure over here that I'm showing you is uh, the experimental spectrum on top. In red is a simulation using just the rigid part, the simple model. That would predict one peak in this area. But really, there are several transitions stacked up on top of each other. And when we add in the methyl rotation, we break a lot of that degeneracy and then we can recover a pattern very similar to the experiment. And so we're able to then go through and fit not only A, B, and C, the rotational constants, but we can fit F, the moment of inertia of that methyl rotor, rho, which is related to the orientation of that methyl rotor with respect to the molecule, and V3, which is the barrier to the internal rotation. So we can really start plucking out molecular dynamics information or intramolecular dynamics from the effects in the rotational spectrum. And one last example of this one is, is really cool. This is very, very early work. We haven't even have a preliminary analysis of this one yet. Pyrrolidone, simple, unassuming pyrrolidone. You look here, the spectrum is fairly simple. We've got a simulated lines at all the main spots where we've got experimental transitions. I think there's an impurity in this spectrum. We just buy these things and use them without any purification. So we've probably got an impurity in there, but the main features we identify. If we zoom in though, and compare it to our simulation, it looks like all the peaks are once again doubled. But this time, we don't have a methyl group to rotate. So at first, we were like, wait, what's going on here? How are we getting this splitting in all of our lines if we don't have a methyl group? It comes from ring puckering. So these, this pyrrolidone, this five-membered ring, isn't perfectly planar. One of the carbons is kind of kicked out of the plane. And it turns out that if you can plot the vibrational potential energy as a function of some coordinate that corresponds to the motion of that carbon back and forth, you get a double well potential. If the barrier inside this double well is sufficiently low, then we break the degeneracy between the symmetric and anti-symmetric harmonic oscillator-like solutions, giving rise to a splitting in the spectrum from the zero plus and the zero minus vibrational levels. They have slightly different structures and therefore slightly different spectrum. So instead of having a single peak as we do in our simulation, we have a pair of peaks coming, one from the plus wave function and one from the minus wave function. So that's a work in progress. We need to understand and analyze these, uh, these sources of intramolecular dynamics in order to have models that allow us to predict spectra of these molecules outside the range we measure in the lab and, uh, and therefore enable astronomical detections. So I've covered a lot of ground, showed you, shown you a few different things here, but I just want to close by saying that we've like rotational spectroscopy and a lot of these 
tools that I've discussed today are really important foundational um, efforts that, that help us understand chemistry in space. So searching for these, uh, trying to understand the origins of nitrogen containing heterocycles that are present on meteorites is, uh, is kind of been a main theme of, of what we're doing. In, in, so we're at very early stages in this. We're doing a lot of the raw input spectroscopy work. Not all of these molecules are gonna ever be observed in space, um, but we are doing follow-up experiments with some of the other uh, um, instruments in the lab to try to study the chemistry of some of these radicals under space lab conditions. And I didn't have time to talk, to, uh, talk about that today. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and uh, wrap up. Um, I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge uh, all of my, uh, my current group of students um, also, my uh, uh, my group's alumni, who are both undergraduate students who have, in many cases, gone on to grad school, and my PhD students, uh, collaborators, funding agencies, and uh, thank you for your attention. Time for a question or two. One first question I just had, uh, it didn't have to do with the Hamiltonians, I didn't think, but you said the, the, the last sample didn't have a methyl group anymore, so what did it have instead? Um, it has this ring puckering motion. No, but what, what's, oh. what's bonded there where the methyl used to be? Oh, the, the hydrogen. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yes? Yeah. Kind of neat, nice field of physical chemistry. <laughs> but, um, it, it, you need sounds like you need really, really, really accurate uh, electronic energy level calculations to get all those little levels accurately. Uh, is it is it possible with that high level of uh, calculation to do something like molecular dynamics uh, so you can test some of these motions out? Yeah. Um, so, ab initio molecular dynamics at the couple cluster level, I don't think it's something that has been done too much because the a single point calculation for molecules of this size may still take 30 minutes to an hour or so, and that's just with one, one frame of your calculation. However, like depending on what exactly we want to do in a particular situation, we, we have used ab initio molecular dynamics for other purposes. So one project that I haven't talked about at all is um, we, we have this ab initio nanoreactor that my colleague Li Ping Wang has developed where uh, we're trying to do some sort of retrosynthetic exploration of potential nit nitrogen heterocycle formation pathways under space-like conditions. And there what we do is we take, say, pyridine, take a radical leaving group, put them together inside a sphere of helium atoms. And that sphere of helium atoms um, is placed inside a, basically a virtual piston. And that piston compresses and then re-expands. And you do ab initio molecular dynamics to model the evolution of the system on that space. And the idea is by compressing this piston, you all of a sudden inject a lot of energy into the system which enables you to start breaking bonds, but then you quickly expand so that the system can then re-equilibrate. And the idea is that you're going to, uh, by pushing the molecular dynamics that way, you start stochastically exploring endothermic parts of the potential energy surface. So you go really uphill in energy. And this is interesting for astrochemistry, not because endothermic reactions are important in astrochemistry, but they're very much not. The temperature's low, you don't really get endothermic chemistry, but an endothermic reaction is just an exothermic reaction in reverse. And so the idea is that by stochastically exploring these high energy regions of the potential energy surface, we might land in kind of exotic territory where we have really unusual or non-intuitive molecular fragments that could then react in the forward direction the reverse of the direction we're running the simulation, potentially without an activation barrier. So we do use those tools, but for this, the high resolution spectroscopy part, yeah. um, the molecular dynamics, like, I mean, some people use density functional theory calculations, so like, it works, it can be done. Um, we tend to rely on couple cluster and higher levels of theory, especially when we're trying to uh, deal with things like radicals and angular momentum coupling inside radicals. So uh, 
for example, in slide that's right now there, uh, when you say that the barrier lowers the two states are no longer degenerate. Yes. If you were to translate it to a more general chemistry language, what does it mean for physical properties of the molecule? What does it mean for physical properties of the molecule? So what I would say is this. Um, if you take any molecule that you want that has equivalent identical nuclei, there's a concept called structural degeneracy. How many equivalent versions of a molecule can you write down just by exchanging identical atoms? Forget about how much energy it would take to do that. If you have to like rip an atom out of the middle of a molecule, put it on the other side, take its counterpart, put it back, there is a quantum mechanical degeneracy. That means there, like, that exchange corresponding to those two nuclei, there are two quantum states physically that exist corresponding to that exchange potential. It has no bearing on any experimentally observable property unless we can somehow tell those two states apart. So my answer is almost philosophical in a sense. It's like, what does it mean for a quantum state to exist? Does it exist if we can't observe it? If it doesn't do anything meaningful? So this structural degeneracy that I'm talking about exists in all cases for all molecules. In this case, that structural degeneracy is accomplished by a mirror transformation. If the energy that's required to do that inversion is super, super high, then the two structural, these two quantum states that I'm talking about will have no experimentally observable, no experimentally observable difference between them. And so for all intents and purposes, they don't matter, but they exist. And when we lower that barrier, it starts breaking that degeneracy, leading to spectroscopic observables. Then we start having to account for it in, in statistical thermodynamics calculations. It starts having an effect on partition functions. It starts having an effect on, you know, when you're trying to account for energy distribution. In the limit that I took this barrier and dropped it all the way down to until it's effectively zero, up to the anharmonicity, these two levels would split such that the zero minus level becomes equivalent to V equals one of a traditional harmonic oscillator. And then the V equals one plus um, would become equivalent to V equals two of a harmonic oscillator. So it's kind of at some level taking these, um, these like structural degeneracies which exist in all molecules and putting them into a situation where we break that degeneracy slightly to make it observable. So observe spectroscopically, yeah? Yes. Okay. Can I do, do that? So just, so I, I guess my question would be from the astrobiology side. So uh, the, the, the rotational spectroscopy that you mentioned is quite interesting uh, tool to study a smaller molecules, a few atoms. I'm wondering uh, whether you also had questions yes. about the existence of the oligomeric form or polymeric form out there? Yeah, so polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are thought to be, to comprise about 25% of the carbon in the universe. It's thought to be locked up in these oligomeric forms. And many of those are either nonpolar or only very weakly polar. So very difficult to detect with rotational spectroscopy in the first place. Um, but rotational, uh, let's see, what's the largest, um, what's the largest pH that's been detected in space right now by rotational spectroscopy? Um, probably like cyanonaphthalene or something like that has been detected. Also, indine, what, benzene plus the five-member like saturated thing, I think indine is what it's called. Those two have been detected by rotational spectroscopy. In the lab, people have gone up to 30 or 40 atoms or so. It's around the largest sizes that people have really done. It becomes a challenge of even getting enough sample into the gas phase when molecules become very, very large. But there is some limit. You know, as you grow in molecular size, the spectral lines get closer and closer together and become more and more congested. Um, so there is some limit. We're not going to be able to like take, you know, DNA, like some, some long polymer and then do a unique rotational identification. 
uh, for a few reasons. One of which is just the sheer size. The other is the conformational complexity. I didn't show it here, but some of the molecules that I, that I did have multiple low energy conformers, and all of the, like, the total molecular population is spread among those different conformers, and each conformer has a different rotational spectrum as well. That it further increases the complexity as you go to large, very flexible structures. Let's go ahead and oh, let's go ahead and thank our speaker again.